And now that we're recording, I'm going to go over and broadcast to Facebook to make sure we're all loaded up over there. Okay, yes. Okay, it takes just a second for it to load up. All right, there we are. Okay, all right, we are now live over to Facebook. So I am gonna go ahead, there we go. I'm gonna go ahead and call the meeting to order. So I'm going to call the Advisory Committee on Participatory Democracy to order. And I am going to remind everybody as we, when we start, and I'll probably do some reminders as we're going along because I forget this too, is just to make sure for minutes and for the transcription, that when we speak to go ahead and remember to say your name. And so I know when we start to talk with Mark, it, we can kind of get the back and forth thing going. Just always remember to say, oh, it's Sandra or it's Doug. And then that way it's easier for Gail and the folks who do our minutes to get that done correctly. Oh, and there's Janie, so we'll let her in. Um, Gail, could you do a roll call, please? Yes. Carmen Bello, not present. Secretary Sagaski. Here. Chair Cosgrove? Here. Kathleen Dickinson? Here. Douglas Goodman? Here. Jane Maloney? Present. Kathy McAdoo? Here. Swadeep Nigam? Not present. So we're missing uh, Carmen and Swadeep. Um, if they come in, uh, maybe somebody could let me know if you let them in. Thank you. Okay. All right. I just need to make sure that our video is up and running. Because for some reason, okay, there we are. All right. I am going to go ahead and put the information that folks need to know for public comment if they would like to go ahead and call in. So I'm going to put that over on the Facebook Live. And then we're gonna move into the agenda item for public comment. So public comment uh, is for information that the public would like to provide us. Um, it's not anything that the committee can actually take action on, um, but we can take it under advisement. So I'm gonna give folks who are engaged on the Facebook page, because we already have a couple, and then anybody else who got the agenda who would like to call in, we'll give them a few minutes to be able to call in and put the meeting ID in so we can see them. Okay. And, and then uh, folks who are on the Facebook page or listening in, um, you can also put comments or questions on our Facebook page in the comments and those will be saved as well. Okay. All right, so I don't see anybody calling in. So I'm gonna go ahead and move forward, but we will have, oh, there's so deep. We'll let him into the meeting. All right, there we go. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and go ahead and we will have public comment at the end of the meeting as well in case anybody maybe logs in a little bit after this that you'll still have an opportunity. So moving on to the next agenda item for possible action, approval of the minutes of the advisory committee meeting of March 22nd, 2022. And actually, I'm gonna hold, hold that thought for just a second. It looks like we might have somebody that wants to do public comment. I will double check on this. Okay, so uh, the folks who've called in, would you, if you would like to do public comment, um, if you would just unmute yourself. Let's see if we can get this to work. Okay, let me see if I can help them unmute. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Ed Gonzalez. Yes, um, yes, Ed, go ahead. Public, I'm here for public comment. Yes, go ahead. I can speak? Okay. Yes. Um, um, Madam Chair, members of the, of the committee, uh, my name is Ed Gonzalez. I'm a Henderson resident speaking as an individual. Um, as you look forward to the um, reports of looking at what, how we can improve the um, primary um, election and moving into the general election. I just want to highlight one thing that I've noticed. 
There are about 4,000 plus voters in Clark County whose ballots were undeliverable. And out of those, there were a couple hundred who actually were still able to vote in person. Um, the concern that I have is not that their ability to vote, they obviously have a right to vote. It's just finding out if, they are, if there's a process or a process might need to be created to ensure that they're voting at the right address. And so clearly if a ballot is rejected in the mail, there's some concern about them not living in that area. Um, the normal process, as you know, is, is a, a, a postcard would be sent to a home to verify that. But with a mail ballot and even a sample ballot, that's actually a rejection does not automatically put anybody onto an inactive list. And so as you look through this process, I wonder what the other counties are doing to this. So I appreciate the time, um, Madam Chair. Um, always want to look at ways to improve our election process. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Really appreciate that. Is there anyone else that's called in that would like to do public comment? Okay. And then we do, I think, have some questions on Facebook. But I'll look at those while we're doing presentations. And if we need to, we can pull them forward during the second public comment. Okay. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and go on to the agenda and we're gonna go back for possible action, approval of the minutes of our advisory committee meeting of March 22nd, 2022. So does anybody have any recommendations for edits, updates, anything that you see that's wrong with the minutes that you would like to put on the record now? I don't see any hands. I don't see anybody coming off mute. Um, so as such, can I, if I could have a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve. Doug, and a second? Kathleen seconds. Okay, and then all in favor, if you could come off mute and say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Okay. Aye. aye. All right. <laughs> all right, so the minutes are um, unanimously approved, so we're now going to move forward. Um, so the next item on our agenda is a report on voter registration party affiliation statistics from Deputy Secretary of State for Elections, Mark Velashin. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Mark Velashin, Deputy Secretary of State for Elections for the record. I'm going to pull up a quick presentation that will actually cover the next couple agenda items. Um, pull that up right now. Okay, um, is everyone able to see that? All right. Yep. Excellent. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, all right, there we go. Okay, so again, good afternoon. Uh, these are really just the next handful of agenda items, the next five items, uh, some of which involve me alone, some of which involve other members of the committee as well um, that we'll talk about here over the next uh, roughly I think there's eight more slides total, including the one at the end, which is the question slide too. So I don't wanna scare anybody off, uh, but hopefully there'll be some good discussion. And certainly if you have any questions at any point during the presentation, please just let me know. Uh, to start with, uh, we're going to start by talking a little bit about voter registration party affiliation statistics. Um, so this is uh, our most recent um, voter registration statistics. Uh, we will be publishing more here by actually in the next couple of days as we approach the end of this month. Um, well, this in and of itself is, uh, again, fairly straightforward uh, and in order to contextualize it a little bit. Um, the next slide actually has a comparison to the same month from 2018 as well as 2020. Um, with, there's some key takeaways that I'd like to highlight as we uh, look at those numbers. So first of all, and uh, I just want to highlight again that well, as a state, we continue to, to increase while there are certainly some ebb and flows to our overall voter registration statistics in regards to the total number of active registered voters. Uh, we are still hovering approximately around 1.8 million. Uh, there, there's an ebb and flow to that, right? Um, you know, when we have a, uh, an election, for example, where, you know, for the primary, we'll use that as an example, and the same thing will occur after the general. When we send out mail ballots, uh, that, that are, it's now codified in our statutes, of course, but pursuant to Assembly Bill 321, um, the number of ballots that goes out to that active registered population, uh, there, there's always going to be a percentage that comes back as being undeliverable. Uh, actually, we had public comment just a minute ago mentioning some of that. 
Uh, when, when the clerks get that information back, those ballots that are uh, identified as being undeliverable, uh, that enables them, uh, again, to move forward with the inactivation process. Um, and then there's, there's kind of a, a back and forth to that as, as we get closer to a general, some of those individuals uh, whose ballot was undeliverable will then re-registered uh, or updated the registration rather uh, with their new address uh, before becoming an active voter again. Uh, but again, also, right, and it's important to keep this in mind that Nevada is a very transitory state. We have a lot of folks moving in and out uh, here from other countries and other, other states across the country um, and other folks that are moving on uh, from our state to elsewhere. Uh, and as a result, uh, you know, that while we, we certainly you know, pride ourselves in keeping the rolls as clean as, as possible, uh, it, it will always be a challenge. Uh, and it's a unique challenge that when we talk about voter registration statistics um, it is one that actually is ended up help is being helped by uh, mail ballots. Um, remember, there's no requirement to vote uh, as an active registered voter. Um, so in the past, we've had individuals who hadn't voted for a decade plus, uh, but were still active registered voters. Um, now, though, with the mail ballots uh, being as, as sensitive an issue as they are, uh, more and more people are recognizing that if a ballot shows up to an individual's house, and that individual does not live there anymore. It does contribute and, and, and uh, it, it helps expedite the identification that people have moved um, or other type of situations uh, that would warrant them being inactivated uh, pursuant to the appropriate statutes. Uh, but looking specifically in comparison on this slide to 2018, uh, 2020, and the 2022 numbers, uh, there, there's kind of a, well, a fairly obvious uh, change over the last couple of years um, that, that is, is worthy of note. And that's really, again, the, the non, no political party and the minor party numbers here in the state um, have, have, have clearly increased so that while historically there, they had been a smaller percentage than the, uh, the two major parties, um, it, that is no longer the case. Um, Mr. Gibbon, you, you mentioned that you have some uh, some further analysis on this. Would you mind sharing that with us as well? No, I mean, and going over the minutes uh, from the last meeting, I had highlighted that the share, the voter share, the percentage of non-D or R was, you know, the highest in the state in Washoe and Clark among younger voters. But I think two other uh, statistics that, that jump out, and this is as of the end of July, uh, when you look at the Senate the legislative districts, uh, you basically have 75%, uh, three of the four congressional districts, nine of the 21 Senate districts, and 18 of the 42 assembly districts, where the percentage of non D or R is the largest uh, block of voters. That's about 40, 42, 43% of the legislature. And then what's even more interesting, because we think of the rural counties as being uh, you know, fairly uh, red, the average percentage voter share, uh, not D or R in the rural counties is 32%. And uh, Mineral County actually for a couple months, that was the highest, but actually now, uh, with the 32% average, it ranges from a high of a 38% in Mineral and Lyon County to a low of 22% in Lincoln. So, I mean, this is, you know, it's, this is statewide. I mean, this is happening throughout and, you know, the rurals uh, too, the only age group, the only group where this is not happening is the 55 and over. Uh, the older voter tends to you know, stick with the party registration and uh, it's fairly equal Republican and Democrat in that demographic. But those are just a few other interesting uh, statistics that I uh, pulled up. And again, that's the end of July. Thank you. And, and again, right, like given our closed primary system, um, you know, one might have expected that maybe the inverse of this would have happened. Maybe as you approach the, the June primary, uh, maybe more individuals would have committed to a, a major party um, so they could take part in, in that closed primary system that we have. But uh, the fact that we're still at these numbers uh, indicates that the, even, even the allure, so to speak, of a closed primary wasn't enough to, to alter uh, our voters' opinions. What was interesting, uh, in 20, normally you do see that, oh, like around April and May start to happen. In 2020, it didn't. Uh, 
This time it did a little bit. You saw a little bit of an increase in Republican registration. Uh, I think some of the same day, uh, talking to my wife who was a manager at a polling location, said a lot of the same day was Democrat going to Republican. And I think there's speculation that there was a large Democratic move, a strategic voting move to happen there. But it's nothing, the, the change is nothing uh, like it was back in 16 and 18, uh, when you definitely saw months where people were do, were changing and now it's not happening. Definitely, you're, you're right on that. Mm. So we'll continue, of course, to, to monitor the statistics. You'll see um, another report will be coming out here in the next couple of days, as I mentioned. Uh, of course, we'll be tracking this monthly like we always do and posting them on the, uh, the website of the Office of the Secretary of State. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how, how things continue to, to ebb and flow in the coming months uh, as, as we ultimately lead up to uh, our next new-ish uh, election, the, of course, the presidential preference primary in February of 2024. Uh, we have had a presidential preference primary, of course, before, back in, I think it was 96 or so, um, so I can't say it's entirely new. Um, but, but again, the, you know, watching these statistics, uh, as the state continues to grow in size, as we continue to receive uh, individuals from other states who are, who are relocating, uh, it's certainly going to have an impact overall on the demographics. Uh, any questions on voter registration statistics? I don't see any hands. Okay. So moving on, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the voter participation uh, during the 2022 primary. Uh, first, uh, as far as kind of an overview uh, and to compare it also to put a little bit context. I won't compare it to the 2020 primary, which of course uh, you, you all remember was the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it, it was a, a pure vote by mail upon the request of the, the county officials as well in discussion with the secretary uh, in the office. Um, it, it, it's enough of an anomaly that uh, again, there isn't a lot of uh, utility necessarily in comparing it. But by looking back at the, as a comparison to the 2020 general election, uh, there's some interesting trends that we can identify as well. First of all, just a pure uh, participation. Again, you can see it was 23, a little bit over 23% um, involvement by our voters in turnout. Uh, and we'll talk about the breakdown here in a moment. I did want to highlight before we get to the breakdown, though, uh, that there was a, a little bit of a success story, a little bit of one. Uh, again, pleased but not satisfied um, in regards to the use of the effective absentee system for elections. Uh, the E system, as you may remember, back during the 2021 legislative session, was increased, uh, expanded rather its use uh, to include voters with a disability across the state. Um, that combined with our, our efforts to conduct outreach uh, increased it so that we, we were able to get some individuals more so than a, a typical primary um, and, and certainly move more voters with a dis uh, disability than we've seen in previous election cycles. Keeping in mind, really, again, it was the 2020 general was one of the most recent uh, where there's a, a decent amount of turnout uh, using the E system. These numbers, of course, uh, are something that we're going to keep a close eye on and certainly uh, incorporate into our outreach and awareness to try to make sure that uh, not only members of the military, but also our overseas citizens, as well as the Nevadans here in the state, are aware of the options uh, that they have to vote and are able to use it appropriately. Uh, case in point, we have had a, a recent attachment from the Nevada National Guard is actually deployed to Poland, I believe, or somewhere over in UCOM um, in the European Command area. Uh, we, we are currently working through a process where we're going to try to present to a number of these individuals uh, who are deployed overseas uh, to make sure that they're aware of the options available to use ease as we approach the general election um, and, and those sorts of, of outreach efforts which are, are low cost and, and really uh, you know an important part though of, of getting the word out about this process and this program in regards to though the uh, the table here at the bottom of the slide uh, a couple key things also that we want to uh, highlight and indicate uh, again broad brush strokes here but uh, mail, mail use, you know, that voters choosing to use a mail ballot, 55.7%. Uh, uh, again, that's a little bit above, um, you know, even you know, where I think a lot of folks were anticipating it. Um, I, I will tell you, when you look at the early voting percentage, the election day percentage, I think there's, there's a significant lesson learned there as well. Uh, with an early voting turnout of 206 Now compare that to the turnout during early voting of the 2020 general election. 2020 general election, it was 40.6 during early voting uh, with an 11% on election day. And now you can see the election day is spiked up to 23.6% uh, as well. 
right? That, that's, a, I think, a, a key indicator here and, and something that, that, you know, as election officials, we talk about fairly regularly. When people ask us, well, do you think they're, you know, the mail ballots are going to be used a lot? Do you think people are going to vote on election day? Uh, who knows? <laughs> who knows what the voters are, are thinking or what they want just yet? Uh, certainly, it's, it's not worth predicting. And ultimately, you know, from, from a county election point of view, it's something that they have to prepare across the board because we just don't know if it's going to be a heavy mail turnout or if it's going to be a heavy election day turnout or a heavy early voting turnout in person. Um, so as a result, truly the clerks uh, and registrars have to, to make sure that they're prepared and ready for a large amount of mail ballots, but also prepared and ready for a, a large amount of in-person voting, either in early voting or on election day. And, and the amount of logistical and you know, human resource uh, challenges that that creates um, are, are no small thing and will certainly continue on through future election cycles. Um, <clears throat> and, and lastly, I didn't, I didn't talk about it with the overall voter turnout. Again, primary, uh, a midterm primary to a presidential general election isn't a great comparison, but, um, you know, uh, just for keeping in mind as we look to the next couple months, the 2020 general election cycle did have about a 78% turnout. Um, just for comparison. So as we go through November, uh, it will be interesting to see uh, if even in a midterm, if, if there's that high level of turnout or not. Any questions on the voter participation? So I do, it's Sandra. Yes, ma'am. So um, I'm a geek like you, so I've been looking at these numbers. So technically though, we had a lot more people get registered to vote. So the number of people who are registered to vote actually got bigger. And if we look at the percentage of those people who turned out in the primary, it's a small number, but technically it was quite a few people who turned out comparatively because we had more voters. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, okay. ma'am. Okay. Absolutely. And that, you know, the, the number of active registered voters and, and eligible but unregistered, that's something that, again, we continue to make a point to, to examine. Um, particularly trying to identify if there are obstacles to voter registration, if there's you know, challenges that keep people from the, the ballot box. Uh, again, really looking to make sure that, that you know, when it comes to the application of our laws and regulations, uh, that they are being uniform, apply, uniformly applied across the state. And, and again, if there are any identifiable obstacles, that those are the sorts of things that we're, we're able to address. But yes, ma'am, excellent point. All right, thank you. Mark, Mark this is Doug. Uh, do we know the percentage of eligible voters that are not registered? It, it's a bit of a guesswork. Uh, again, this is Mark Velashin again. The, the eligible but unregistered percentage um, is, is there's a, I don't have it in front of me. I will certainly be able to get it to you before the, I think the, the meeting is done today when I conclude my presentation. Uh, but there is a kind of a standard percentage of, of a state population that it's assessed uh, it may be eligible but unregistered. Um, and I can't recall what that is offhand, but I, I will get that to you. It, it is a bit of guesswork, of course, uh, and, and I would argue that I think our state, given the amount of transients that we have, uh, you know, in and out, uh, it probably varies at, at times. Um, but I'll, I'll see if I can't find that here in a few moments. Yeah, I, I know the few things I've seen, uh, Nevada is actually doing pretty well uh, in the uh, percentage of, of eligible who are registered. Uh, so I, I was just curious. We had, I mean, it's it's not that critical uh, to know that, but I was just curious if you if you knew. So thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, for this this part of the agenda, uh, again, I, I think this ultimately may turn into hopefully a little bit more of a discussion uh, with Chair Cosgrove and others on the on the committee. Um, but one of the things that we, we look to and I want to talk about um, in, in regards to involve, uh, improvements to voter participation and really you know, in, improvements across the board, because this is something that when I talk with our county election officials, every one of them across the board um, is of the same mindset where, again, please but not satisfied, where the, the application, what we're doing, we're following the laws and regulations. That, that's a, a separate topic. I mean, in regards to, to being able to understand what, what's going on, conveying the process and procedures to the public, um, examining the information that we request. In some cases, there were templates, for example, that we used uh, to, to request information from the county election officials that we then aggregate into uh, voter turnout, uh, for example. And, and these, you know, over the years, these spreadsheets have gotten kind of large and unwieldy and uh, frankly, uh, are almost more of a challenge than not to, to compile. 
Uh, we've looked very closely at, at the, again, recognizing the amount of, of um, challenges that your county election officials face and how many things they actually have to do, not even necessarily related, related to elections, right? But the fact that, you know, our 15 uh, elected county officials, um, you know, got a multitude of other tasks from public administrator and everything else. So we're, we're trying to look critically at, at what information, what, what touch points do we have with the county election officials? And then, uh, you know, do we need them? Are, are there things that we're asking for that, that maybe have kind of grown on their own and maybe exceed some of the statutory or regulatory requirements? Are, are the templates that we're using to ask this information clear? Um, I will tell you in many cases that, that they're not. Uh, and, and frankly, because we have so many clerks um, who are new over the last couple of years, uh, there's become a uh, you know an opportunity for their new sets of eyes to to look at the template and then to contact me and say, uh, hey Mark, like what what is this asking for? Like this is how I interpret it. And uh, sure enough, like we're understanding that there there are multiple ways to interpret some of these documents, which created confusion in the past. Uh, so there's a great number of things that we continue to look very closely at. Um, and and the, the, I think the two big ones uh, that I want to talk about before going into, and this, these really are kind of an umbrella under which all of the, the bullet points on this slide fall under. The, the first is education and outreach, really, really focusing uh, you know, on the needs of the public. Um, it, it's not just that we have a transient uh, population that need to understand the differences between our laws as a state and, and what happens elsewhere, uh, oftentimes from the states they came. Uh, but also explaining the changes in many cases for those Nevadans who, who've been around for multiple generations who have heard and seen different things change. Uh, there's just so much nuance to, to what change um, that, that continues to be an obstacle for a great number of individuals who contact the, the office here and call the elections division or email us uh, asking, like, why, wait a minute, why, why are you doing this? Like, I, I, I can't get an absentee ballot request form anymore. When did that change? So the bottom line is, is out, uh, education and outreach, it, it has to expand. You, you may remember that during the 2021 legislative session, we made a point uh, as part of the fiscal notes related to every bit of elections, uh, every BDR related to elections, to identify the need, the importance of educating the public about that. Um, unfortunately, uh, again, there were, there were no funds allocated to that. Um, and so understanding uh, that that was still a requirement, you know, over the last two years, we've made a point to um, on the cheap, do as much outreach as, as physically possible, a uh, considerable amount of Zoom calls, uh, you know, telephone type interviews and outreach, uh, replying to individual constituents who reach out to the secretary to the elections division uh, to talk to the office about, you know, why something works. Um, but, but the simple fact of the matter is, is while our, our efforts have been at times, you know, pretty valiant, I think, um, it, it's just simply not reaching the population uh, in a manner that it's effectively uh, providing that level of education that I think the, the voters really are, are, are hungry for. Uh, this is something that, again, has, has been echoed across the state. I know, again, county election officials were in a very similar position uh, where, again, competing requirements, uh, you know, the, the multiple needs of their various offices, uh, you know, oftentimes when, when something has to give, it unfortunately sometimes is the, the uh, outreach type opportunities. Um, so this is something when, when we think about education and outreach and how we can increase voter participation, really it goes back to, you know, helping ensure that the public understand the processes, uh, understand where to go for answers to their questions uh, and are able to learn about these processes so that they have confidence. Uh, because that's one, one common theme that we've heard when people call and ask to talk to me, um, you know, if somebody doesn't have confidence in the process, then they say, oh, I'm not going to, oh, I'm probably not going to vote because I don't, I don't feel like my, my vote truly matters. Um, and, and oftentimes a lot of their concerns are just based on, on, again, statutory changes that maybe they just weren't aware of. Um, so education and outreach is certainly something that I think uh, it needs to be continuously expanded. And then the second part uh, relates to more of a training piece, training and education. Um, as you all are aware, uh, again, out of our 17 elected officials, a number of them have, uh, you know, since the 2020 general election, uh, resigned or retired. Um, even fairly recently, uh, again, uh, another one of the appointed um, clerks in one of our counties uh, has announced that she is leaving the office. Um, this, this turnover is resulting in, in a, a truly a, a dynamic shift in the, the entire, uh, you know, um, the relationship between the county election officials and the state, to be frank. Um, it's a sea change. We've been talking about the sea change for some time. 
Uh, for, for you know a long time, we had elected officials at the county level who in many cases have been there for decades, uh, knew the ins and outs. And then you know here at the elections division, we had some newer staff members that, that were almost at the times learning under the tutelage of the elected officials at the county level. Um, I'm not gonna say that's changing. We still have a lot of really experienced uh, elected officials at the county level and our registrars as well, um, but there's change in the wind. Um, again, with uh, our registrar, both registrars actually will be, um, uh, you know, one in, in Washoe, she has already uh, left her position. Um, it's my understanding that Mr. Gloria will be leaving his position in January as well as he retires or, or moves on. Um, so there's, there's going to continuously be an, uh, this, this level of change where there becomes a, uh, almost a training gap that needs to be addressed. Uh, that will also, I think, help out in a lot of the regards to relating back to voter participation. Uh, and what do I mean by that? When, when you have a newly elected uh, clerk come into office, or, or even here at the state, when we have uh, new hires, um, you know, it, on top of all the multitude of tasks, right? Like it's, you can't simply say, look, here's the deal uh, at, at the state level. And I'll use one of my own staff members uh, as kind of an example. If we hire somebody, uh, on the one hand, certainly I can say, here's, you know, welcome to the team. Here's your task that we need you to do, uh, you know, a series of tasks based on your performance standards. But the reality is, right, like, as you all know, uh, I, there's more to it than that. I, I have to expose to them, uh, to, to all of Title 24, right, like the nine chapters that make up our election laws, plus the regulations, plus the federal laws and how that, that comes into play. Um, and, and if you haven't been in a position where, you know, you, you can, you can imagine almost the, 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 the poor individuals that come into the team. And on day one, I'm like, when was the last time you cracked open the U.S. Constitution? Uh, you know, it's, it's, maybe it's been a couple minutes, I guess. since uh, maybe high school or before that. I'm like, great. Well, uh, we, here's a copy. We're going to break it open and start looking at it because there are requirements, day-to-day -day requirements that are identified in our U.S. Constitution. Uh, never mind, like, opening up the state constitution. Never mind looking at the statutes and regulations. So that that the learning curve to go from welcome aboard on day one uh, at the state to being fully functioning, understanding, and not just the, the what has to happen, but the why behind it. Uh, that can take six months to a year, to be, to be very frank. Um, and even more so, I suspect, at the county level, where, again, they've got, uh, again, public administrator type responsibilities, clerk of the court responsibilities, oh, and then the, the little slice of, of their time that's supposed to be focused on elections. Uh, so that, that, that's another thing that I think as, as we look to the future, trying to identify ways to increase the training opportunities so that a newly elected uh, or appointed clerk is able to step in, uh, get some level of, of uh, formalized instruction. Um, so that way, uh, again, they're able to focus on the day-to-day -day requirements, their jobs and the needs of their constituents, uh, while also then being able to then turn around and almost immediately, right, provide that information back to the public who are going to call them and say, well, you're my clerk or registrar now. I need to know, I want to understand this concept and I want to hear it from you. Um, so those are some thoughts I had and, and uh, Chair Cosgrove, uh, do you have any thoughts or, or discussion points on here you'd like to bring up? Sure, uh, this is Sandra and I'm gonna say something and then I'll bring Doug in. So um, two years ago when we had to go to the complete mail-in, I think there was an awareness among all of us that we all needed to be responsible for helping to educate ourselves and helping to educate our neighbors. And so there was kind of a community effort at doing civic engagement and civic education. I wish we could have like put that in a box so that we could have kept it around on the shelf and used it every election cycle because we didn't do as much of that this time. And I think people ended up having mail-in ballots that were not counted because of that. Because I know one of the things that we really emphasized when we said everybody's getting a mail-in ballot was telling people to log into the Secretary of State's website, go into the online voter registration portal, check your address, check your signature, check your party affiliation, make sure everything was up to date so that people then got that update into the system before the mail-in ballots came out. And I think a lot of people um, had a problem with the mail-in ballots in either not signing the back of the envelope or their signature had changed enough that it needed to be verified, but then they didn't have contact information in their voter registration account. And so it was really hard to get a hold of them and some of those ballots didn't get counted. So I, I am with what Mark said. I think, I think all of our um, agencies need to be funded to a certain degree for civics education. And it's not just elections either. It could be health and human services. It could be our education system. 
there's all these civics processes that if people don't know about them, there's no way for them to be engaged in government and voting and all those important things. So I, I agree that we need to make sure that during legislative session, that when we talk about funding education, it's also funding education within, within each of our agencies so that they can do civics education with the public. Um, Doug, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, uh, I had a few questions. And I mean, of course, I'm very familiar with Washoe County. Uh, and so, I, but I wanna keep this general if I can. Uh, Will, because of the turnover, uh, and it's, you know, basically from your office all the way through the 17 counties. Uh, is there anything that your office can send out as a reminder to the election officials in the counties? Uh, because this does impact the voters, uh, you know, that, you know, that they do remember to turn on their uh, sample ballot program. People can get the online sample ballot that when they're training their poll workers that they make and sending out supplies to the polls that they have some kind of checklist to make sure all the necessary forms and supplies are getting out to the election workers who need them uh, so that they don't have to be you know scouring around making phone calls i don't have this important form that i need to open up uh type of thing uh, possibly you know a checklist of when you're doing training here are things you need to make sure you cover uh with you know here's what you need to cover with your managers your system managers here's what you need to cover with your poll workers uh because i think that impacts the voters uh impression of what's happening the other thing and i don't know if this is just me but one of the things i am very worried about uh, with this election is the potential of so-called poll watchers, uh, poll workers who are actually having an agenda coming in, how that could impact uh, the coordination with law enforcement uh, to be available readily. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm personally, I am very worried uh, about that. So I don't know what what's going on behind the scenes with that, but. Uh, more things just with the turnover of clerks and registrars that they make sure that the poll workers have everything they need to make sure the polling locations are operating smoothly. I think there were some hiccups this last time. And uh, of course, this is, you know, we've got all our statewide offices. So, you know, if it's anything like normal, you know, 60% turnout. But so anyway, those were just my, my questions. So thank you. No, this is Mark Velashen again, and, and thank you, Doug. I do appreciate that. Now, you're you're absolutely right, and I think you, you hit on one of the key things that we picked up collectively, right? Um, I mean, one of our clerks, right? She started the position. Uh, she took over as appointee. Uh, I think it was three, four weeks before the, the actual date of the primary election itself. Um, so yeah, talk about an uphill learning curve there. Um, but but not only her, but I, I was very happy, and I think you all would be be proud of this as well. And, and really, frankly, it's, it's what you would expect. Um, the, the clerks, registrars, and, and the elections division banded together, uh, shared ideas, and we're going to continue to do that in regards to best practices, lessons learned, um, certainly in regards to checklists and those sorts of things. And, and a lot of what I referred to earlier about, you know, the, the new sets of eyes saying like, well, do we have a checklist? And if not, why not? Like, is this the first time? Uh, why are we relying on someone's memory who's been doing this for, for maybe years, but, you know, in truth, only does it every other year, right? Uh, you know, at best. Um, so those sorts of best practices, you know, again, have been shared and will continue to be. Uh, I'm confident that while, uh, again, as you mentioned, there were some uh, concerns uh, raised in, in various counties, uh, I'm confident that, again, in most cases, those will have been addressed. Some require other, uh, again, they're, they're complex issues that require funding and additional space and those sorts of things, too, that the counties are addressing and, and identifying um, that might take longer to, to address. Um, but, but certainly those are things that we've identified as, as you know, needing to happen. And, and when it comes to the turnover, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's, there are some things that, you know, it, it may, it may not be realistic to believe that for the next, you know, if, if you look 10, 20 years into the future, uh, how many of the elected officials um, at the county level or elections individuals in, in the state at all, right? Any, any election official, uh, meaning anyone in the, here in the elections division, 
um, you know, or at the county level, anyone involved in the elections processes at the county level, how many folks will still be around in five, 10 years? Um, so as a result, we, we kind of anticipate, not that we think there's going to be a continued exodus, right? I think that, uh, you know, election officials, uh, for the most cases, um, that are still sticking around, uh, are very proud of the work they do, understand the importance of it, are dedicated to their voters. Um, I, I think, though, that there might reasonably be uh, a decent amount of turnover looking to the future. And so as a result, we're, we're very much keeping that in mind. How are we setting up folks uh, for success so that um, if there is further changeover following the, the, or the, the November election, um, if in a year or so uh, other clerks resign or other staff members too, uh, who are oftentimes extremely pivotal in collecting and you know, distributing data and setting up these sorts of polling locations, conducting training for poll workers and uh, polling location managers, how are we helping to set them up for success using the best practices from the, the, the folks across the state who have got, in many cases, you know, years and years of experience um, so that when we do have that sort of change that, that we're not set back to square one or, or even maybe somehow worse beyond that. Um, and so those, yeah, those are certainly parts of the discussions that we have. Um, but again, right, uh, when we have a lot of turnover even here at the elections division, it's one thing to know what needs to be done and it's another entirely to try to find the time to do it based on all the other priorities that are going on. And that, that is not something unique to the Secretary of State's office. Um, you know, I, I've heard from counterparts in other agencies that you know, that similar uh, you know, vacancies, and I thought I heard 30% vacancies across the state and state government positions, um, you know, that, that sort of thing is just challenging no matter what, what office you're in. Good. Thank you, Mark, thank you. And I'm just gonna, I was just sitting here smiling in, inside because just something you, you'll recognize if I say, Sergeant, welcome to the unit. Here's the SOPs, read them. <laughs> hey, that works, right? <laughs> Does anybody else want to? Uh, Mark, um... This is Kathy. Go ahead, Kathy, and then I'll yeah. go to Kathleen. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to say a couple things. I thought uh, Doug's comments about, you know, if we could get a list like to our poll workers and stuff. But I also think for those of us on this committee, maybe it works better in uh, small rural communities where I live. But I feel like if I had um, just the white paper with just those easy bullet points that I just have that with me at all times and can educate my neighbors and um, people I come in contact with, because I, I've always thought it was just a, a disgrace that we don't have funding to, to educate state on voting, um, but each of us can do our part and it would be really helpful to me if I just had that and then when you're talking about the turnover I mean all those turnovers are certainly uh, critical but I can't help but think we're also going to have a brand new secretary of state without experience and I know as an elected official that you you think you know or at least I thought I knew quite a bit about my role when I ran for office and six years later, I'm still learning a lot of things about it. So we also have that complication there. And I would be remiss when I say that, that um, I have great amount of admiration and appreciation for all that um, Secretary of State Savasky has done to serve the state of Nevada. And I wanted to make sure I got that in today, but I think it's gonna be a noticeable change in the whole secretary of state system with a new person coming in. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And that's certainly something that you've identified too. Those sorts of uh, documents that we can pass out uh, to, to try to facilitate those sorts of discussions. Um, absolutely. Um, and, and you're absolutely right too. Uh, um, secretary Sagaski uh, is lucky to be moving on to retirement and her grandchildren will benefit. Uh, but certainly there's only about 3.3 million of us that will, uh, that will certainly have suffer a loss. Um, right, and I have to take into account of what you, you also said is the jobs of our clerks and you and those in um, the Secretary of State office. I, I mean, every single person in public service is doing more with less right now and that's more with less money, but that's also more with less people because we have a shortage of work 
workforce everywhere. So um, I appreciate that that's going to take time and effort on somebody's behalf, but hopefully it will be helpful when it comes. So thank you. Thank you for what you do as well. All right. Thank you. Uh, Kathleen. Uh, I want to echo um, Kathy's appreciation of Mark and the staff, because I really hope you guys get to stay no matter who gets elected. Um, I have a question. I heard yesterday in a meeting that Nye County has voted to not use machines, that they are only going to have paper ballots. Is that true? No, ma'am. Um... It's my understanding that, well, one, uh, the last I heard from uh, Mr. Camp, who's the appointed clerk there in, in Nye County, um, I have not heard that. And I, uh, he described a parallel process by which they were going to use paper ballots uh, and use hand counts, uh, but as a backup to the mechanical tabulation. Um, I've made a note, though, and I will follow up to confirm that. Okay. I hope they're using the machines. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. But going off what Kathleen just said, this is Sandra. I mean, technically, everybody in Nye County is getting a paper mail in ballot, which they can fill out and sign and hand in. It's just using the machine to tabulate them would be the kind of thing that would be different, right? As I understand it, yes, ma'am. Uh, and again, I, I guess I wasn't sure if the, uh, if the suggestion was that they're not going to be using any machines for in-person voting either. Uh, of course, Help America Vote Act requires at least one DRE uh, that's ADA accessible at each polling location, uh, that sort of thing, of course. Um, but uh, again, raises a question and it's certainly worthy of, of you know, making a couple of calls and an email or two to find out and confirm that uh, you know, the 31,500 individuals who are registered to vote in Nye County um, have the same rights afforded everybody else. Okay, Doug? Yeah, I was just because uh, I know uh, your your comments, Mark, on uh, regulation, and I guess we're sort of sliding into the next uh, agenda item. Uh, but the way I read the reports is that the reason Nye County was not included to use the new regulation was that they are using uh, machine tabulation and then doing a hand count as a verification so at least that's so i mean if if they if there's a change to that as, as kathleen is mentioning then i would think uh they would then come under uh the regulation uh if if they're doing if they're going to go away completely but uh so and i guess you can do that even though the regulation has been approved you can include them back in if they've decided to go away from the tabulation machine tabulation Yes, sir. That's it's certainly something we'll look into. Okay. Anybody else um, have comments, questions, things that you've heard from your your friends and neighbors about the election that we just had for the primary? I don't see any other hands. Okay. So we are ready to go on to the next agenda item, which Perfect. is uh, the agenda item on regulations. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Mark Velashin again for the record. Um, so I, I will start by talking about the most recent uh, temporary regulation and, and the process that we just put it through. Uh, and then I'll talk briefly about uh, the kind of way forward when it comes to regulations and the regulatory reviews that we conduct here in the Elections Division. Uh, first of all, uh, again, about a year ago, uh, when there was first, when the, when the discussion about hand tabulations first started to come across on, on the national stage, uh, this was something that we, we looked internally and, and recognized uh, that we simply did not have regulations to, to cover one way or the other. This was a, a essentially a gap in our regulatory um, coverage, uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. There, are, I'm sure there's probably a, a million things that we could have in our regulations. Uh, but as this discussion about regulations and hand counting and, and what does that look like uh, came up, one of the first things that we did is we reached out to a number of jurisdictions across the country. Uh, to find out from folks who are doing that currently. Um, there are a number uh, of, of jurisdictions across the country that, that are not using any mechanical devices uh, for tabulation, but are purely hand counting. Most of those have, uh, again, I think the average is less than, I think actually 700 um, registered voters in those jurisdictions. So we're, we're typically not talking about very large jurisdictions. 
Uh, but we began our research, started to ask, and, and I guess I was under the impression that, you know, by this point in American history, uh, you know, certainly, you know, I, I guess I compared it to like building a saddle, right? Nowadays, uh, there's, there's plenty of Nevadans who know how to build a saddle and they, they have mastered the technique. Uh, from the 1800s to now, like we, the saddles they build now are the perfect best possible type of saddle that you can possibly make given the technology and, and the need. Uh, I assumed that hand counting would be something similar. Uh, turns out it's not. Turns out every jurisdiction does it pretty differently. Uh, turns out that there's different uh, approaches, different issues that come out of those approaches, uh, different forms, templates, timelines. A lot of this, of course, is because of the nature of state election laws and how every state is different. Um, and so there's different requirements uh, levied upon each jurisdiction that, that does a hand count tabulation. So when we realized that, uh, and that there were in fact this, this very wide range of options to do it and not in fact a, a hand count playbook, so to speak, um, we realized that if we didn't propose some level of regulation, that what would end up happening was that if a county uh, had a discussion about it, if an elected official, elections official rather, um, said, you know, I think, I think we're gonna try to do a hand count, uh, it would almost fall on them to do the research, to do the development of the form, uh, to look around. And, and again, recognizing, like we've talked about already today, that, that each of our election officials at the county level have a million things on their plate. Um, we said, well, we can do the, the, the research. We can do the, the discussions, set up the calls, work, our, you know, work through the, the communication challenges, find out what some best practices are. Uh, you know, look at these, these best practices across the country through the lens uh, of Title 24, of course, uh, because there were some really neat ideas, frankly, that we heard about in other jurisdictions that you know, directly conflicted with Nevada law. So, okay, that's not getting on the list and not working its way into our regulation. Uh, ultimately, again, um, because the, the permanent regulations that the Office of the Secretary of State has to submit to affect an election have to be in place by the last uh, day of February of an election year, um, we uh, proposed some temporary regulations. Uh, these temporary regulations, again, have a, had a workshop. We just had the adoption hearing uh, at the end of last week. Um, because they're temporary regulations, they do not go to the Legislative Commission. Uh, instead, we wait 35 days before filing them with the Office of the Secretary of State, which is, again, us, obviously. Um, but they will be in effect from October 1st through November 1st of 2023, uh, with the, the stipulation being that unless they, they go through the, the permanent regulatory process, which of course includes you know, workshops, adoption hearings, and then, and then a trip to legislative commission for ultimate approval. Um, so what, what do the regulations do? And, and, and we touched on this briefly already. They only apply when a mechanical device is not in use. And, and I will tell you right off the bat, when we started to do the research on this, one of the very first questions I was asked by, by some uh, you know, individuals in the public was, why, why can't the secretary just, you know, the office just outlaw hand counts if, if it doesn't make sense? If you, if you have, you know, uh, you know, Esmeralda has about 620 registered voters, maybe let them, but can't can the Secretary of State just outlaw hand count regulations for everybody else across the state? Uh, the simple answer is no. Like she does not have that legal authority. This office does not have the legal authority to do so. Uh, under NRS 293B050, uh, it talks about how an election may be conducted, um, but it does not say shall. And, and because it does not say shall, you know, the idea that the Office of the Secretary of State would you know, tell people that it was illegal or try to prevent it, uh, it is, you know, at, you know, best illegal and, and also immoral and unethical to, to propose and suggest that uh, this agency has the ability to, to say something isn't allowed just because of a, of a distastefulness or disagreeance or something. Um, so again, when we were looking at the regulations, the goal was to create a standardized method to do it um, so that if a county election official decided they do want to conduct a hand count tabulation, uh, as long as there's a mechanical device backing it up, uh, then, then they, they have a little bit more leeway. They're allowed to do other things. Can they still follow the regulation if there's a mechanical device? Absolutely. In fact, uh, you know, the, the clerks I've talked to, uh, we, I've, I've encouraged them to say, look, if you're going to, uh, even if it's an audit, essentially, uh, of maybe one or two races on the ballot, by all means, like, again, we, we, we established this, we built it as a best practice deliberately to help our, our election officials across the state so they don't have to do that year of research and the phone calls and then the form development on all these sorts of things. Um, so as long as there's a mechanical device in use uh, for tabulation, uh, again, then they're, they're, these regulations are not in effect. If a county says, well, we are not gonna use mechanical devices for tabulation, uh, 
then absolutely the, the you know, the, this regulation, these, these temporary regulations go into effect. Um, so yeah, it, it's ultimately a best practice. And again, there were some really interesting discussions that we had with, with officials across the country uh, who do use uh, hand count tabulations. Um, when, when we asked, you know, you know what, what does it look like? How many voters do you have? And they, they would say, you know, 700, 800 here and there, um, maybe a little bit more. And they asked, well, what about you guys in Nevada? Like, what's, what's that look like? I'm like, yeah, smallest county, uh, you know, about a little over 600 registered voters, active registered voters, uh, largest about 1.3 million. Um, but I, I don't suspect that's going to happen there. Next one's close to about 310,000. Um, but we've got a, a number with, you know, in the, the 20s and 40,000 range, uh, usually met with dead silence on the other side of the phone. Uh, like, are you serious? Are you going you're gonna to try to do this with 40,000 people? Um, we're like, again, just doing research, just looking to see what's in the realm of the possible and want to learn from everybody's you know, real world experience. Um, and so that's, that's how we got to where we were at, where we, we built this idea of, of a four man team where you have two individuals tabulating, where you have one person reading and then someone who's verifying and watching the reader to make sure that, again, as they go sequentially down the list on the ballot, uh, that everything is being read out accurately. Two tabulators. So that way, if there's a question, as you're going down, um, you know that, that you have two at the same time, so you're not having to go back necessarily through the entire stack of ballots if there is a discrepancy. Um, I, I will tell you that the jurisdictions that highlighted that they use hand count tabulations as an audit type practice, and we, we asked about those as well, um, stress that the machines every time come out accurate. Um, just like we see here, again, they, these are EAC approved machines. They go through a state certification process before an acceptance at the county level. Uh, but, but historically, they said the issue, the true issue ends up being human error um, because, you know, they, they highlighted things like, well, if you have your, your poll worker team and they're there and they're counting and they're tabulating late into the night, um, you know, you may only have a couple hundred more ballots to do, but, you know, the individuals have been working maybe 12, maybe 14 hour days. You don't want to let them go just to have them come back for another hour or two of work and then it gets really late and then people are more sloppy. Um, and then historically, again, whenever there was a discrepancy between what the machine said and what the people said, you could go back through the ballot and spot the human error. Um, those, these are all the sorts of, of considerations that we incorporated into these regulations uh, to try to set up a, pro a process that, that, again, would uh, you know, be as, as remotely errorless as possible. Still error prone, given the nature of the, the process, uh, but, but that was certainly the goal uh, that, that we were shooting for. Um, and again, there, there's some concerns about the timeliness. That, that's one part in particular, too, that you'll notice is kind of a common thread across our regulations that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we ask for, if you're not going to use a mechanical device, again, this, this applies, that there's a, a transparency piece of this, where we want the public to understand. We want to reassure the public, uh, because in the same sense, there's a lot of discussion about, uh, you know, concerns about machines. There's also a lot of discussion and concerns about hand count tabulations. Um, so there's, there's requirements for a plan, for uh, observation, uh, an amendment to that plan. So that way, uh, again, if, if a clerk, uh, in coordination with their commissioners or board of supervisors, decide this is the route they want to go, um, uh, again, there's, there's ways that the public can understand what that's going to look like and where they can observe from. Um, we, we highlight the requirement, uh, one of the other ones was a contingency plan, uh, right? We have statutory deadlines that the county commissioners and board of supervisors must canvass the vote no later than 10 days after the election. Um, if they're going to do a pure hand count tabulation, we don't want them to wait until that night of the ninth day before talking to a DA to say, uh, this ain't gonna happen. I don't know what to do next. Like, how do we, can we, do we talk to a judge? How do we move the timeline? Is that even possible? Um, so we're, we're, the intent behind that sort of contingency plan is to encourage those discussions in advance, to make sure that everybody across the board is aware of the risks uh, to, to our electoral process so that, again, we can, you know, uh, appropriately, uh, you know, resource this type of effort. Um, but so that, that's the most, uh, again, the, the latest regulation, again, it, it, it was adopted um, on the 26th. It will be in effect uh, from October 1st through the November 1st of 23. Um, it, but as it currently stands, again, the, the counties that we do have that I've heard from, at least, um, that said they might you know, do something similar to the primary, essentially that amounts to an, a hand count audit, um, basically validating what the machines have tabulated uh, and not a pure machine-free tabulation, which is why, uh, again, as they currently stand, these regs 
uh, you know, may, may go unused uh, through at least the 22 election cycle. Any question on the, this temporary regulation before we move on? Uh, Mark, just, uh, up just a couple things. First of all, I want to thank you for being having the forethought, forethought to actually start looking at this a year ago. Uh, and I was very glad to read that, that this wasn't a reaction uh, to what some of the rural counties were doing. And I was also glad that you mentioned 293B050. And uh, hopefully the legislature uh, will exercise its Dillon's rule authority and change may to will or shall, and plus maybe give a little authority to, you know, or, you know, as directed by the Secretary of State of Legislature, you know, as morale, the county, you know, 300 voters, you know, they're not going to use machines. But I was, so hopefully we will see an, an, a change uh, to that paragraph uh, coming. I know that uh, I've reached out to several legislators in the interim committee uh, to hopefully move that discussion. Uh, but so thank you for mentioning that as well. And hopefully that's something the 23 session will uh, see fit to do. I do have to say, Mr. Goodman, and of course, when it comes to policies, neither here nor there for this agency or the elections division. Exactly. We still I know. I know. Um, but I I, that's why I'm just saying, hopefully they will take care of the fix. So you don't have to <laughs> come back and do a permanent regulation. So this is Sandra, you know, as a historian, I always want to put things in a bigger picture. And I can remember very clearly the 2000 election and watching people with their glasses looking at hanging chads and all of us thinking, why can't we just have machines do this so that we don't have all this variation between people trying to figure out how somebody voted? And so I think we're kind of going through one of these weird cycles where we're, we're forgetting why we moved away from, you know, having too many people being involved and the bias that that brings in. And I, I think maybe historically we need to put this back into that bigger context because we all were on pins and needles watching individual people trying to figure out how other people voted just with their eyeballs. And that was kind of scary. Yes, ma'am. And, and, you know, that, that speaks to the, the capabilities of these machines. And if, um, you know, if there's any interest that, and, and I know a lot of it, something a lot of the county clerks and registrars have talked about trying to do demos to set up, to show what the process looks like so that you can see, you know, when we do our pre lat and you put the tiniest of dots on a ballot that you put through as part of the pre lat process, it catches it every time. There's no question about it. It's going to say that that's an overvote because this is the full circle and there's a dot, a stray mark that our statutes say makes that an overvote and that race then doesn't count on that ballot. Um, that level of capability, when you see it, when you try to crumple up a ballot and put it through and how it can still read and process and it does it accurately. Um, it, when you envision you know, the, the 11th hour uh, and how exhausted it would be, you'd be to have to stare at these things constantly. Um, Yes, ma'am. There's certainly a reason that we, the machines are, are relied upon accurately. Without bias, they don't get tired. Uh, don't even need breaks to use the head, that sort of thing. Right, right. Uh, anybody else have uh, comments or questions about these regulations or anything related to the election process? Don't see any hands. Okay, um, and, and I uh, just, I'm going to echo what Doug said. Thank you for explaining exactly what's going on, because I think it's been a little jumbled in the press, because I think there have been some stories that came out, and I think this is what Kathleen probably heard too, where we, you know, especially the national press, because they oftentimes don't actually talk to people like Mark, then saying, oh, no, they're going to do hand counting. And so it's, it's good to be able to hear the whole explanation of exactly what's happened, so that if I'm talking to a reporter, I can just have them watch this recording. Yes, ma'am. And I, I will tell you, too, that in, in my discussions with the county clerks about this process, uh, e even for those counties that may do a, a similar hand type audit, um, I, I think, again, right, when, when we think about the voters that are concerned about the machines, this, this may frankly be an opportunity for them to see and to, to personally be involved in, in auditing and verifying that the machine count is right. Um, and, and I think that, that, you know, certainly if there are issues with the machines, then uh, that'll come to light. But I will tell you, even the two counties that did these audits during the, you know, right before the, the canvas for the primary, uh, that it was, it was human error, adjudication errors, really what came up. But my hope is that for an individual who doesn't necessarily trust the machine, 
that, that now has an opportunity and, and a process that they can get involved and, and take part in an audit, uh, see that the machine works, see that it's actually really hard to hand count stuff for weeks on end, um, and, and hopefully build some trust you know, as we move forward into future election cycles. You know, Mark, Mark you just, this is Doug. Uh, you just brought up something as, as, to emphasize that point. Uh, at the polling location, my wife worked for early voting. The, the gentleman who had volunteered to be the manager there was an election denier. And he went into this, volunteered to be the manager to see for himself what was going on. At the end of the 14 days, uh, he basically left it. You know what? I'm glad I did this because now I'm comfortable, I feel confident that we've got it right. Yes, sir. And, and, and you know, a, again, I will say that that is also truly a bipartisan type of issue, that the lack of understanding, the concerns, it's absolutely understandable for anyone to be concerned that their vote may not count for some reason, uh, which goes back to the education, the, the outreach, um, you know, it, and while I don't think that ultimately we'll be able to set up 1.8 million polling locations for everyone to get a chance at being an election manager. Um, I'm already pushing my kids to do it. So sometime maybe in the next decade when they get close enough uh, that they can understand and really see you know, how the sausage is made specifically to support that, that level of understanding. Okay, so um, I think we've wrapped up on this agenda item. So we're gonna go on to agenda item number nine and look at our important dates that are coming up. Yes, ma'am, thank you. <clears throat> So in regards to the 2022 general election, a uh, handful of dates I, see, I, I put here on the screen that, that I'll speak to is really just reminders. Um, first of all, you know, the, the opt-out deadline uh, by statute, uh, no later than 60 days before the election is coming up. That's uh, next Friday, not this Friday, but the following Friday. Uh, and as a reminder, again, individuals who have opted out of previous election cycles, uh, that, that remains. Uh, there is a process that when you submit the form that you can say, am I opting out of all elections or just this one? Uh, again, for an individual that, that said all future elections, they are still opted out. Um, but if you haven't yet, uh, or if you're new to the state and would like to not receive a mail ballot, uh, certainly you're able to do so uh, by identifying that uh, to your clerk by next Friday, September 9th. A couple ways that you can do that excuse me, online through the Secretary of State's website, even just calling or going in in person to your county clerk. Uh, if you call them, they'll be able to direct you towards where their form is at. And I know many county election officials have forms on their desk uh, when you first walk in so that individuals can opt out of receiving a mail ballot. When we look at the timelines for mail ballots being sent out, of course, there's a federal and state timeline, a mandatory um, mailing for military and overseas. It's uniform and overseas citizens absentee voter act. Those are the Eurocava voters. <clears throat> uh, no later than 45 days prior to the election. That's also when we turn on the ease system, the effective absentee system for elections. Uh, that will be on the 23rd of September. Uh, and then again, uh, let's see here. Uh, mail ballots. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. The, the in-state mail ballots uh, generally will go out. Uh, it, it's, it's an interesting, again, kind of behind the scenes logistical piece of this too, right? Um, as a county election official approaches the, the deadline for mail-in ballots in-state, really what, what it looks like is they, they start by providing their uh, list of voters to a vendor who then creates the ballots and mails them off. That, that's not a one-time thing. It's not a single event. Um, there's, there's kind of a sweet spot that the clerks have recognized where if you do it way early, uh, you know, close to that 45 day mark, for example, uh, you, you're at a point where maybe some folks haven't even thought about the election or haven't updated their contact information or addresses, uh, as you had mentioned. So folks who have not maybe voted during the primary uh, without any issue, but then moved since uh, oftentimes get kind of caught in this, this spot. Um, so if you do it too early, you end up having a large percentage of mail ballots come back as undeliverable. On the other hand, if you wait to the very last minute, then, then frankly, voters getting, get a little bit nervous about uh, when they're going to receive their mail ballots as well. So there's a, a point for each of the counties where about, uh, again, a month out, give or take, uh, they'll send that first batch off to the, the vendor who will then create the ballots and send them. Of course, if somebody has opted out of receiving a mail ballot, they, their ballot is not made, their name is taken off of that list, essentially, um, so that they don't have to worry about a ballot being created and then set aside somewhere. Um, and then there'll be repeated, uh, again, orders of, as updates come in, because um, of course you can update your, your registration 
uh, all the way up to 14 days before. So if you update your voter registration 15 days before or make a modification, you can, you'll still have a mail ballot sent to you um, per, the, per the statutes. Uh, closer than that, then you'll have to, to vote in person, but there are still, again, in-person opportunities for voting, uh, just simply not receiving a mail ballot. <clears throat> There's a period for written challenges, uh, 293-547. Uh, I, I wanted to highlight that as well, October 9th to 14th. That, that's closing in on, of course, uh, just prior to the early voting period. Um, that's something that, that, again, is in statute and, and the clerks are, are expecting and, and keeping an eye out for any written challenges relating to a voter's uh, registration or uh, eligibility. eligibility. Um, the early voting period uh, starts October 22nd, uh, which is a Saturday and goes up to Friday, November 4th. Uh, then there's that, that brief gap before Election Day on Tuesday the 8th, of course, when the polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, following that, and again, I'd like to remind folks that the, uh, the electoral process does not end by midnight on election day. Um, of course, we have the, the four days afterwards, um, after election day up through November 12th, uh, the county clerks and registrars can continue to receive a mail ballot that has been postmarked appropriately by election day with an additional two days afterwards for, for signature curing. Now, you all may have caught, and this is something that we identified back before the primary the first time, um, that when you look at the couple days after November 8th, there's actually a holiday and a weekend there, right? Uh, when you have Veterans Day and then it rolls into Saturday, the, the 12th. Uh, that's something that we identified and have already reached out to our, our friends with the U.S. Postal Service uh, to identify, hey, the statute says four days after we can accept a mail ballot that's been postmarked. But if you say 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, two of those days, one's a Saturday and one's a, a federal holiday, uh, many, many post offices are closed. Does that mean that the de facto acceptance is only for two days? Uh, that, that's obviously something that's concerning. So we've worked with, our, again, our, our friends at the Postal Service uh, and, and across the state have identified ways where the clerks are able to pick up mail ballots that are received up to that fourth day to make sure that we're not only complying with the statute, but also that voters are able to have their, their ballots accepted up to that fourth day. Uh, and a similar sort of consideration regards to the signature curing timelines. There's two days beyond it. <clears throat> uh, again, with, with one of them being a holiday or a weekend rather, um, again, making sure that the voters still have the ability to cure that signature up through the sixth day as appropriate. Uh, we've been asked, well, wait a minute, isn't there a statute, something about like a weekend delays it or something that, Talking about 293, it's NRS 293-1275 that, that specifically refers to a filing of paperwork. So like a filing period, candidate filing, for example, uh, or the filing of a uh, campaign finance report, uh, but does not apply to the acceptance of, of mail ballots um, and, and those sorts of things. So uh, we have been working again through the, that sort of challenge to make sure that again, voters uh, um, aren't disenfranchised uh, because of the, the days of the calendar. The canvas by the, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, let me back up. There's one, one additional one in between the 8th and the 22nd. Um, the county commissioners and board of supervisors have the canvas, of course, no later than 10 days after election day, so no later than the 18th. Um, then that will be followed by the Supreme Court canvas on the fourth Tuesday, which is uh, the 22nd, uh, and that will be here in Carson City. There's a, a recount timeline as well. And again, I mentioned this uh, for everyone's awareness. Uh, there's a period to submit for a recount. Uh, if it's a, a candidate who wishes a recount, um, again, if it's a statewide or a multi-county office, uh, the, the period of time uh, you can see on, on the, the slide here is November 23rd, and then it jumps to the 28th and 29th. Those are the three working days after the canvas because of the holidays that we have. We actually have two holidays in there, the 24th and 25th, of course. Um, if it's a county-wide request for a recount, uh, it's actually three working days after their, their canvas uh, by the county commissioners or board of supervisors, uh, which again may vary slightly depending on the, the specific county and when they actually canvas. Um, all that to say, these are things that again, uh, rest assured your election officials at the county and state level have been talking about, are prepared to, to, uh, to keep in mind about it and, and certainly ready to address. Um, with the recognition that, again, if a contest is requested, um, we have to begin no later than five days after that request and must be completed no later than five days after as well. Um, so there is, unfortunately, the possibility that when it comes to a contest or a recount, that it may go into December 
Um, so again, uh, for individuals that think, oh, you know, election officials must be, must, must be nice and quiet starting on what, November 9th or so, um, maybe December 9th, maybe. Um, but, but one way or the other, again, the work needs to be done to make sure that, that every vote is counted and, and uh, uh, tabulated appropriately, and that all the appropriate uh, requirements afterwards by the statutes uh, are met. Any questions on the, uh, the dates on the slide or timelines that I described? So this is Sandra. I'm going to jump in and then I'll see if anybody's hands up. Um, I know that this is the thing that confuses a lot of people. I get more questions asked about the at, what happens after Election Day because everybody got so used to it's Election Day. We know who won. We move on. And now there's all these other benchmarks about um, postmark ballots and curing and making sure people didn't double vote if they did same day voter registration. Um, but it, so this this extended timeline after election day is related to the changes that we made as far as mail-in ballots, same day voter registration, all those things where we said, like you said, we want to enfranchise more people. But then if you're going to add security in to make sure it's done correctly, then we have to take a little bit of extra time. Would that be a correct way to, to talk about it? That, that's absolutely correct. Um, it, and certainly there were differences in, for example, the, the county commissioner's timelines to canvas um, before the, you know, the Supreme Court canvases as well. Uh, but, but yes, the, the bottom line is the, the reason for those delays are, are so that, um, again, well, specifically, right, the clerks, the county election officials have up to the seventh day after election day to finish counting. So that specifically, as they get the mail ballots, they can receive them, validate the signatures to make sure, just like you said, that, that from a security point of view, that that is in fact the voter. And if it's not, if there's a question at all, then the clerk's going to reach out to that voter to ask them to confirm that, that signature curing process. Those things take time. And you're absolutely right in saying that, uh, again, these are all changes to the law. These, are, these aren't you know, kind of personal preferences by any stretch of the imagination. I will also stress that not only are they the law, but they're also absolutely different from all the other states around us. Um, so when we have friends and family elsewhere and they're talking about their unique situations and their thoughts on their you know, governor and constitutional officers and the elections and those sorts of things, uh, it's important to remember that our process follows our state laws um, and, and is very different than everywhere else. But, but yes, the bottom line is those delays are uh, related back to security. Anybody else have questions or comments about this? One last thing too, I, I have seen, and we've gotten a couple of calls about the, the difference between like certifying and canvassing and, and the Office of the Secretary of State's role. Um, again, just to make sure that it, it's clear, um, again, by that 10th day, the county commissioners certify the county level election results by canvassing the vote. Uh, we gather that information here at the Office of the Secretary of State, and then the Secretary has a ministerial duty to present those to the Supreme Court um, on the 22nd for the Supreme Court canvas as well. Um, so again, it's, it's a really a county focus, and then to the Supreme Court um, really is what it comes down to. Okay, so I don't see any questions or comments on this agenda item, so we'll go ahead and thank Mark, because I always appreciate the fact that you come and give us this information. Um, did you, is this your last slide? Yes, ma'am, it is. Okay, it, go ahead. That's all go right. Ahead. Yeah, go sorry, ahead. This, this, to, to kind of wrap everything up, uh, I did want to just clarify for kind of the way forward. So, and it ties into really to each of the previous agenda items. Uh, first and foremost, we've talked about it a little bit, but the, the staff, the vacancies and retention, making sure that we continue to make, you know, to, to manage our talent, to get the right people on the team. And again, I, I, if you knew the people in the doors behind me, or, uh, you'd be proud to have them as your, your election division here at the Office of the Secretary of State. Uh, the data collection through the 22 general election, there's a number of other things that we're looking at too, as we try to think about you know, uh, other possibilities. We talked about the hand count regulations that we worked on developing. There was another thing I did recently where, uh, you know, recognizing that you may remember just a, a few weeks ago at this point, there was a, a decent amount of smoke uh, coming from a fire down in Yosemite. Uh, reached out to NV Energy, had a lengthy discussion with them about uh, public safety outage management, the PSOM process, and how there are areas that are scheduled for, uh, if, if there's a high risk of wildfire, they, they, there's a plan in place by MB Energy to, uh, again, it's last sort of ditch issue, but to, to shut off power. We're overlaying the maps of that against our polling locations so that our clerks and registrars are aware if, if they have 
uh, polling locations that may be in a, in a region that's prone to wildfires that, again, it might be worth thinking ahead, not something necessarily for 22, but looking to the future, uh, wanting to make sure that as best as possible, the locations we're selecting is, is polling locations, the, the, the backup power sources, generators and the like, are all in place well before we actually need them uh, come some, you know, smoke-filled June elect, you know, election day uh, or, or something in the, in the winter. But there's a number of things that we continue to look at and analyze as part of our effort to continually improve the process. Uh, we haven't talked about Assembly Bill 126. Uh, perhaps in, in one of our next meetings, whenever those do uh, occur or, or even off on the side, we can certainly talk about the preparations that we're, we're making leading towards the presidential preference primary, uh, which comes up again in February 6th of 24, uh, or the candidate filing period for that October 1st to 15th of next year. So we're looking at 14 months before we have the candidate filing for the presidential preference primary. Um, so it's so a continued effort and work goes into that as well, uh, on top of all these other challenges that your, your county election officials are looking at. Regulatory review, we'll be getting that again in January. We'll start the process, continue the research uh, with a, an anticipated date around July or so, where we'll start having the workshops and adoption hearings after the session. Uh, in preparation for, for, again, solidifying and revising our regulations before the 24 election cycle. And then again, we keep stressing the outreach efforts, uh, but, but that's absolutely pivotal to our way forward, making sure that we provide every opportunity to inform and educate voters, to help them understand that this very complex process. Uh, when, when people call with questions and they're like, man, I, you know, I feel kind of, like, don't feel embarrassed. Like I read this every day and it's completely, it's probably more complex than people realize. And if you don't think that, then you, you don't understand it. Uh, but absolutely appreciate your efforts and help in this regard. No, we, we appreciate this so much because I don't know how many other states where you get to have the Secretary of State and the Deputy Secretary for Elections just sit on a Zoom meeting and hang out with us and explain some of these things so it's easier for us to explain it. Yes, ma'am. Well, well, thank you for your time. And uh, that concludes my portion, unless there's any questions. Yes, I will stand by them for a bit. We'll, we'll go Doug and then Swadeep. Just yeah. one quick uh, question, I, and I hopefully for SB one, uh, AB one twenty six, the presidential primary. I see that as a an outreach effort, uh, not so much for the presidential primary, but I see that there's going to be a need for an outreach effort to remind people come June, come our state primary, that oh no, you didn't vote for these offices in February because. Without that, I think the potential for a disastrous uh, state primary turnout. Uh, so I, I just see that as a, you know, a, a definite outreach challenge uh, when that goes into effect. Absolutely. I mean, I'm already anticipating uh, where are all the other offices on this ballot. All I see are presidential, you know, candidates. Uh, hey, wait a minute. I thought I thought I was supposed to have a president on mine. Why is this just the June primary with the boring stuff? sort of comments and questions. You're absolutely right. Uh, Swadeep? Yeah, uh, I have a question for Mark. Uh, about, uh, we have talked about regulations. Uh, is there any, I mean, any regulations on when the county election department should be cleaning their voter rolls? Because I've heard they clean it up on a regular basis, but are there any regulations or deadlines like every fourth Sunday they clean it up? of the month or are there any regulations? And the reason I'm asking, because I know of individual who passed away in January, 2021, but when I was going through the roles, you know, during the primaries and as of March, 2022, that individual was still listed as an active voter. So, I mean, even after 14 months after that individual passed away, but, Today I checked, he's not there anymore. I mean, not on the active voters list. So are there any regulations that, uh, yeah, they match all kinds of records, death records and uh, people moving out of town. Are there any regulation when they clean up uh, their databases, active voter rolls? Yes, sir. This is Mark Velashen for the record. Mm -hmm. there, there, there absolutely are regulations as well as statutes and federal requirements as well, mm -hmm. limiting both what we must do as well as things that we cannot do. Um, that's also another one of the processes, though, that we continue to look at uh, different resources across the, the, the different counties, of course. Um, and, and this is also something that when we transition to a top down system, uh, that that entire process of identifying individuals who need to be inactivated, the, the counties then acting upon that. 
um, and all those different elements of the, the voter list maintenance process will, will continue to be refined moving forward. In, in regards to the, uh, you know, the individual or individuals rather who have passed away, it, it's one of the more challenging aspects that we have to, to work with. Um, unfortunately, there's some really interesting but, but unfortunate kind of uh, background about how the, the, the registrar of vital records you know, there's, there's oftentimes a lag before they can get a con confirmed death certificate. And then that's the required document that they provide to us. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are some records they send to us where they don't have the social security number, for example. Uh, it's just a series of nines. Um, mm -hmm. But then again, if there's any doubt at all between one individual who has passed away and another individual who maybe hasn't, uh, we do not inactivate them or cancel those individuals because we don't want to risk disenfranchising someone. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that is one case and one situation in particular, though, that, that we're certainly continuing to look at and identify means to improve, um, with the goal being that, that certainly, uh, again, we, the clerks, as much as anybody, understand the importance of list maintenance, want the, the rolls to be clean. I mean, it saves money. It saves ballots going out to people that have already moved. It, it, I mean, it, it's less returned mail that they have to process afterwards. It, you know, so everyone, I think, is, is collectively unified in that desire for as clean rolls as possible. Um, but there's some, some technical things we're continuing to work through and some procedural ones as well that we're trying to address to, to try to find any level of efficiency and improvement. Oh, so, Swadeep again, uh, is there any time frame? Because this uh, particular individual was there for 40 months, you know. Well, uh, if it's possible, maybe we could talk separately and I'd like to get the individual's name so I could do some research because you're right. Like the questions I have is, you know, how long before the Office of Vital Records had that individual's death certificate? When did they come through on one of our rosters? How long did it take for us to, to get that trans and, and to turn around and provide that to the county? Uh, and, and those sorts of questions as well. And th those are always data points that I'm very much interested in looking at. Um, okay. Thank you. Sir. All right, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Okay, I don't see any other hands. All right, again, thank you, Mark. We appreciate you uh, being willing to do this and to take our questions because it helps us, you know, um, like Kathy was saying, that when we're talking to friends and neighbors, we can help to clarify or get back to you and do some clarification. So that certainly helps. Yes, ma'am. Always a pleasure. Okay, so that was agenda item number nine. So we're going to go to agenda item, item number 10 for possible action. Discussion and possible action concerning a committee request for a proclamation by the governor for Constitution Day, which is September 17th, 2022. So does anyone want to make a motion for the committee to pick someone to put that request in to the governor's office for the proclamation of Constitution Day? So I'll move. Okay, Doug moved. Anyone want to second? Carmen Avello, I second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. So the motion is, is do we want to have a discussion on selecting one of the committee members to contact the governor's office to get a proclamation for Constitution Day, which is September 17th, 2022. So all those in favor, if you'll say aye or just even put your hand up, I can do a quick count. Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Okay, I think we're good. So now what we need to do is we need to volunteer somebody to um, talk to the governor's office. And actually, I've already talked to Doug about it. Um, and Doug said he would be willing to do it. Oh, was that the, was that the good? Yeah, actually, that was that thing. Actually, I'll pull the one that I sent off uh, last time and just uh, probably resend it. <laughs> yep. And then well, that way we can make sure we get the proclamation in time. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we've taken care of agenda item number 10. So agenda item number 11 is discussion concerning National Voter Registration Day, which is September 20th, and encouraging activities promoting voter registration during September. Um, Secretary Sagafsky, did you want to speak on this one? I can, if you need me to. We had a discussion this morning in our deputy meeting. And again, Barbara Sagafsky for the record. Um, we have uh, asked the governor for a procl proclamation, um, and so we're hoping to get a response. Uh, Scott and Jennifer are working on that out of our office. Okay. Uh, Gail, did you want to say anything about that agenda item? Um, I would just add that during September, um, if 
we have in the past years, uh, I have been able to do some voter registration in one or two schools. Um, but this year, I'm also going to be participating, representing the office in a civics in action outreach two Saturdays, one in Southern Nevada on September 17th, the other in Sparks in Northern Nevada on September 24th. And this is part of the Voices in Voting program um, that initiated in Southern Nevada has expanded to statewide. And I'm doing the voter registration component of that outreach event in both of those locations in September. So looking forward to that. Excellent. Um, does anybody have anything that they would like to share about an activity they may be uh, participating in related to National Voter Registration Day? Okay, so I know at the, the, this is Sandra, at the College of Southern Nevada, I've been talking to our new student body president, and she's very energetic, very much into civic engagement. And one of the things that she said to me is she said, students, when we ask them, you know, are you registered to vote? And they're like, yes. And are you going to vote? And they're like, yes. But then they'll always say, but nothing changes, or I don't really feel like my voice is heard. There'll, there'll always be like this reservation that comes after voting. And so they, the student body president, her name is uh, Yvette Machado, she really wants to focus on civic engagement as soon as the election is over, just to make sure that, that students are aware that they can engage with the legislative office or they can engage with the secretary of state's office. There's things going on all the time that, like this committee, that you know, individual members of the, of the community can be involved in. But I think that might go back to when uh, Doug was asking Mark about how many people that are eligible to vote but don't register to vote. So for some reason, they're not actually getting registered and they're not participating. And to me, it's just, I keep hearing over and over, just people do not feel like they're being civically engaged. And so I, I'm hoping that our legislature can start maybe investing money in every single agency, providing our directors, our agency directors with the ability to do more outreach, to talk to more community members, to get them involved. Because I think that might help get more people willing, being willing to get registered to vote and then to turn out. Anything, uh, anybody else? I'm, I'm gonna get off my soapbox. There we go. Uh, any, uh, anybody else wanna be on the soapbox? Go um, ahead, Barbara. Will, thank you, uh, Barbara Sagassi again for the record. Um, there are groups as you've talked about um, that do talk to their membership on a regular basis. We go to a lot of the uh, different uh, uh, events and they do talk to their, uh, their people, their members, and do advise them to get involved and to vote. Uh, they uh, advise them to register to vote. They have questions where they can go, what they can do. So there are groups out there that are helping with that. Excellent. And I, I know the Secretary of State's office, your budget as far as you know, community education and outreach is very small. Um, but I always appreciate the fact that wherever you go, you bring it up. That whenever I've heard Gail speak or Mark speak or the secretary speak, she does talk about engagement. She does talk about it being something that you do on a continual basis. And I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Okay, so now we're going to go to agenda item number 12, which is the report on the 2022 Helen J. Stewart Awards. And that is Secretary Sagaski. Thank you very much, Sandra. I appreciate that, Madam Chair. Um, we were very lucky. We had um, three schools this year that uh, we were able to uh, go to and, and talk to. Um, Gail presented the award for this one at the Seniors Award Assembly. And this is um, a Kipo Academy is a college preparatory public charter school in Clark County with 101 seniors who were el eligible to register or pre-register to vote in the class of 2022. They registered all 101 eligible students. So thank you to all of them um, for doing that. That was great. The second one was for um, the fourth time, Shell Ridge High School won the award. No other high school in Nevada has achieved this award as many times. And of the 644 seniors who were eligible to register or pre-register to vote, 560 registered, which is 87%. Um, commendations to the government um, uh, teacher who is Matt uh, Nyswanger. Nice Nyswanger, I'm sorry, Matt. I just want to make sure I get his name right. 
for his efforts. And I presented the award at the special assembly with student speakers talking about the importance of voting and being involved. They really did a good job. It was, it was just an excellent program to attend and to go to. We really enjoyed it. Uh, got to meet a lot of the students and talk to them. It, it was a great, great event. And then the last one, which was really kind of fun because Gail and I had to fly. Um, a road trip. Yeah, we did a road trip. And for the first time, Battle Mountain High School won the award and of their 70 eligible seniors, they had 86% registered to vote. Gail, my chief of staff, Scott Anderson, and I made a road trip to Battle Mountain in May to present the award. We had an outstanding visit at the school. They treated us so well. We had lunch with student leaders and a tour of the school before the assembly uh, presenting the award. And along the way, we stopped at a couple of clerk's offices and historic courthouses. If any of you haven't traveled up north, there are a lot of um, historic courthouses up there. So we'd love to invite anybody to go up there. But we're just really thrilled with these three high schools, what they've accomplished, what they've done. It just made us feel really good. But we had an excellent time. It was a very, very good time. That sounds awesome. Thank you so much for going up there. Because again, I'm going to say it, this is the thing I love about being in Nevada, and this is Sandra, is that I have to remember sometimes not to say, well, I was talking to Barbara and they're like, who? I'm like, oh, Secretary Sagafsky, because she's just Barbara, my friend, you know, and it's so easy right. in the state to, to know our elected officials and to have them come out and do lunch. And so I really appreciate the fact that you do that. Well, we loved it. It was yeah. great. We were just so excited with Battle Mountain High. Um, we couldn't have been more thrilled when Gail told me that they won. I went, let's do a road trip. Let's go there. Let's uh, surprise them and we'll give them the award and we did and it was great it was wonderful that is so cool uh does anybody have anything they want to say about that agenda item no okay all right so we're going to move on uh the next agenda item agenda item number 13 is an update on the civics excellent program that was established by senate bill 194 in the 2021 legislative session uh concerning the state seal of civics program and I noticed that Jamie needed to drop off, so I'm not sure if she's gonna be able to come back on. Uh, is anybody else working on that that might be able to give an update? Uh, Kathleen, are you? I can't um, speak to a specific update, but I do know that our Nevada Center for Civic Education um, engagement staff has been working on the seal and it should be ready shortly. Oh, excellent. I, I do know that after the last meeting, our, our our last committee meeting, this is Doug. Um, I did talk to, to Janie, uh, as we said we were going to, and she did answer a lot of my questions, a lot of my concerns that, that I expressed, uh, not only during the hearing, but during uh, the, our last meeting. And uh, so I'm looking forward to, actually I was looking forward to her, to her report, so, uh, but hopefully we'll get that, uh, She'll be able to send something out to, to let us know. But I, I, she did answer a lot of my concerns when we did talk okay. uh, following our last meeting. And your concern was that it, that it wouldn't really mean anything, that it wouldn't be have the substance, correct? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anybody, anything, anybody else wants to contribute on that agenda item? Okay. I don't see any. Uh, so we're going to go to agenda item number 14, the report on the Nevada Student Mock Election 2022, and that is Gail Anderson. So, Gail? Yes, so this is Gail Anderson. So the Secretary of State will again, uh, once again, offer Nevada students the opportunity to participate in a student mock election. Um, the Nevada Student Mock Election um, information has gone out with the coordination of Jamie Malorney and the Department of Education, a letter, a joint letter signed by Secretary of State Sagaski and Superintendent Ebert was prepared. It was distributed through the Department of Education to all administrators, uh, superintendents, I should say, in the state and to school principals and to teachers. Uh, there were a couple different versions of the letter that was distributed early in August and that has gone out. We've already actually had some inquiries come in uh, through that portal on the student mock collection. 
The um, mock election the, will open for voting on Friday, October 21st and will close at 3 o'clock p.m. on Friday, November 4th. So that is a week prior to the, uh, obviously, the general election in Nevada. And it is that uh, Friday, November 4th, that is designated as Nevada Student Mock Election Day. So there's information. Um, I work with staff in the elections division with Mark and his staff on the actual process for this. Uh, the mock election requires an online registration by a school coordinator through um, a special website. It's linked to on our website, but we'll get that out. It'll be social media posted. And it went out in the letters as well. Uh, there are two ways for students to vote. Two years ago, we only did online because of pandemic and students were at home. But we're resuming having an option for a school to do uh, paper ballots, uh, which they print and then they conduct the election and they tally the results. And then we ask their school coordinator to submit those results, to log in and submit those results to the uh, statewide voting that is coming in through online voting. So there's online voting where the school coordinator can get IDs and passwords to issue to individual students in the school, whether they're doing a certain grade, whether they're doing all government classes, however they're handling it at their school. And then those are done, um, submitted, or rather voted online. And actually we're going to have a more extensive ballot for 2022, we're going to have all six constitutional officers, not just governor. And then we have the one uh, US Senate seat that's open, the four congressional districts that we set up the voting for those to be geographically located for the district that the school is in uh, for that uh, particular position. And there will be two of the uh, voter ballot questions also on the student mock election. So curriculum uh, through Jamie's department is there's a task force and a group working on curriculum for teachers to use all that heavy, you know, in process uh, to get done here in September and prepared and ready for October. So it's a very active program. We hope to have really good turnout and participation in the year. And then we release those results usually before election day. We haven't set that date when the student voting would be released. But uh, that's what we're doing. And it's a great program of the Secretary of State's office that we partner with the Department of Education. And it's promoted as well through Voices, uh, Voices in Voting and um, any other groups that uh, contact us and say we'd like information on it and help promote it. Awesome. That's it. That's, that's very good. Um, so this is Sandra. If you're gonna put all the constitutional officers on that ballot though, you need to memorize what the controller does because that's the number one thing people ask me. Cause they're like, what is this? I don't know what a controller is. So that I'm, I've got that one memorized. Every, they can figure out the other ones. It's that one that gets people confused. But But I like that because we have more than just one constitutional officer that's going to be on the ballot for everybody else. Right. Yeah. Right. And so that'll be actually one of the curriculums as well as what maybe some of the main duties of each of these offices um, and what they do because controller, you know, one, one gets the bills and one pays the bills. Right. Right. I would say it's the office with the checkbook. <laughs> that's how I remember it in my head. It's the person that has the checkbook that actually writes the check. Yeah. Yep. Very, very good. All right. Uh, any questions for Gail on that program? Very exciting. Glad to hear that. All right. So moving along on our agenda, we are now on to agenda item number 15. And this is comments from the Advisory Committee on Participatory Democracy members. And I would like to start this off and say that I have thoroughly enjoyed this committee. Um, and I don't, I promise you, I don't say that about every committee. I have thoroughly enjoyed this one and it's gonna be sad, but this is our last committee meeting with the secretary. 
Mm-hmm. And so I want to take just a moment to tell her how much I appreciate her um, and just, you know, to spend this, to devote this much time to community members being able to understand what our election processes are, to ask questions, to let Mark literally go everywhere and talk to everyone. From the bottom of my heart, I appreciate you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you very much. And, and I, 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 I wasn't sure if we were going to sneak in another meeting in uh, prior to your departure, Madam Secretary, but uh, obviously not. And I just want to thank you also for this opportunity uh, to to work with you to, you know, serve the state of Nevada in this role. And I I only hope that your successor keeps this committee active. Uh, and again, just want to thank you. And again, this is Nevada. I I remember the first time we met, uh, you know, in a coffee shop. I think it was back in 2015. And yeah. So I, I just again just want to thank you so very much. I think you've been a such a benefit to this state and an example on how elections should be run. And so thank you, and you are going to be missed by the entire state. And enjoy your grandkids. <laughs> thank you, Doug. I appreciate it. Uh, anybody else want to chime in? I would just like to echo what you, Sandra, said and what you, Doug, said. Um, you've been terrific. Your office is terrific. Your staff is wonderful. And I truly do hope that the staff remains again, like I said, no matter who gets elected to this office. But thank you so very much, Secretary Sagast. Thank you, Kathleen. I really appreciate you and everything you've done as well. Okay, anybody else? This is Carmen and Bello. I just wanted to say Thank you, Madam Secretary, for the opportunity, and thank you to all my fellow committee members. Um, I didn't do a lot, but I do appreciate being able to participate, and uh, I admire all of the hard work that you guys have put into everything. Thank you. Uh, Swati, did you want to yeah. say anything? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I appreciate all the work being done by uh, Barbara Sagaski, Secretary's office, and thanks for appointing me in this important committee. I learned a lot, and I uh, hope wish you all the best and we'll be in touch. We'll be, and, and also, I mean, keeping the election integrity intact. Uh, you know, there were a lot of issues in 2020, 2016 elections, but thank you, Barbara, Barbara and Secretary Sigaski for uh, uh, maintaining the election in pro- process of the elections uh, uh, as per the statues, Nevada state statues. Again, thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you. I really, really appreciate it, Swadi. Thank you. Okay, so that means on our agenda, we are now for uh, at the second public comment period. Okay, before you go to that, can I say Absolutely. Something? Oh, yes, absolutely. Go ahead. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. As you all know, this is the last meeting during my tenure as Secretary of State with this advisory committee. And I don't know what the next Secretary of State will do in regards to the advisory committee. Um, Gail will be meeting files, so there is documentation of what has occurred. And a few of you have uh, appointed terms that do not end until June 30th, 2023. That's Doug, Kathy, and Swadi. You, you three um, don't end until the 30th, uh, 2023. And I want to thank each of you for who you have served as a member of this advisory committee during my term of office following legislative changes to the ACPD in the 2017 legislative session. In particular, I want to thank Dr. Sandra Cosgrove, who agreed to chair this committee. You've done an outstanding job chairing this advisory committee with your knowledge and years of experience in working to educate and engage the public and how to participate and how to be an informed community and you're still doing that thank you thank you you have facilitated holding meetings on zoom so that we could continue meeting when we could not meet in person and made it easier for members of the public to follow and participate sandra you have done a commendable job as chair and i thank you for your leadership To those of you who have served more than one term of appointment, many thanks for your service and commitment. Carmen uh, Avello, you've been with us since 2018, as all of the rest that I'll name. Sandra Cosgrove, Kathleen Dickinson, Douglas Goodman, Janie Maloney, and Kathy McAdoo. 
You have all contributed and made this a significant means to communicate accurate information to the public. So from me to all of you, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart um, that you have taken the time to participate, be an active member. And I think we've done an excellent job in communicating and the things that we've done through the years. And Gail, I want to thank you for your service to this. Uh, Mark, thank you for educating all of us on a continuous basis. So thank you very, very, very much, every, every single member and everybody. Um, I just can't thank you enough. God bless. All right. Thank you. We're going to miss you. That doesn't mean we're not going to be seeing you again because we're going to probably come ask you to do other things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, before we go to public comment, does anybody else have anything they'd like to say? Okay, I don't see any hands. So we're going to go into our last public comment. And we do have someone in the waiting room, and he's been following along on Facebook. So I am going to go ahead and bring Scott in so that he has a chance to do public comment. All right, Scott, if when you are ready, go ahead and come off mute and you can do public comment. Oh, I just ran across you guys on Facebook. Barbara, hi, this is Scott Hohen. All right, Scott, if when you are ready, go ahead and come off mute and you oh. can do public comment. You'll have to you'll have to mute Facebook because you'll we'll get there's a lag between what we're doing and what you're gonna hear there. Got it. There we there. go. You can hear me. Mm -hmm. Um Thank you. This is Scott Hohen. I'm running for the Carson City Clerk Recorder position, and I hope to be working with the state. I always enjoy Mark Balachin's presentations and information. Hi, Barbara. Thanks for doing what you're doing. I just I stumbled across the live feed and I join it and I always learn something new. So I appreciate the information. So thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. It's always good to know that people have come across our Facebook Live. Um, which will be recorded and will be on the Secretary of State's Facebook page with our other recordings. Perfect. Okay. Thank you much. I don't see anybody else in the waiting room for public comment. So I am then going to go ahead and um, ask for a motion to adjourn. Well, I make a motion to adjourn. All right. And do I have a second? This is Kathleen, I'll second. All right, in a second. Okay, so um, all those that are in favor, go ahead and give me your best Zoom wave because this will be the last time we get to Zoom wave with each other as far as this committee. And um, we'll go ahead and end the meeting. And again, if you wanna go back and share this recording with anybody, it's on the Secretary of State's Facebook page. You just go, if you go over to the video tab, you'll be able to see the recording and then share it. All right, all right, thank you everyone. We'll talk to you thank later. You. All right, thanks. thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.